No. <laughs> Well, you know, if, if, you, if you didn't want an answer, you shouldn't have asked. <laughs> but is your, is your idea that we will look at this dog? Yes. I think we're just going to go back. Maybe. Thank you all for coming. Uh, today, um, John Quo is going to end his graduate career um, with the defense of his dissertation. Um, I, I um, although John's been in the lab several years, I uh, never really realized that that um, he had gone to Columbia. I thought that you know I knew that you had gone to school back east someplace, but I never realized that you were at Columbia, and I never realized that you had a degree in math. So now I'm going to hold you to a wholly different standard. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was only, there's only one blemish on John's uh, career, which has been stellar to, uh, to this point, and that is is that he went to medical school oh. across town. <laughs> <laughs> but after Columbia um, and medical school at SC, he came here and has uh, completed uh, residencies and fellowships in. And I think um, the, the uh, dissertation speaks for itself. Uh, he's been extremely productive in my lab. Uh, he's been co-author on seven uh, papers. There were four papers before he, he came in uh, to the lab, and there were also two uh, book chapters. So John has been uh, very uh, prolific in, in expanding the literature. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that John uh, is a recipient of Scholar of Reproductive Science, Scientist Development Award, which is a joint program with uh, Bayer and uh, NICHD. Uh, this is a five-year program that uh, will allow John to build his own, his own laboratory search, his own uh, program. Uh, it's a very prestigious award, and uh, I was very pleased with when John uh, got that. So uh, without further ado, John, uh, the podium is all yours. Um, if you have any questions, I think it'll, uh, it's up to John whether he wants to accept them during the, the talk or, or afterwards, but, but then when, when it's done with the formal presentation and we're done with questions, uh, I'll ask the audience to leave and the committee will stay and we'll have a little discussion with him uh, about the finer points of his dissertation. John? Well, thank you for uh, coming to my talk today. Um, if you have questions, I think it's probably okay to ask <laughs> okay, so my talk is on membrane estrogen receptor alpha interacts with metabotropic glutamate receptor 1A to stimulate intracellular calcium release and progesterone synthesis in female hypothalamic astrocytes. I don't know if you should turn on. Dan, do you mind? It may be a little easier to see. Oh, too much. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So, the main outline of this talk. In this talk, I'm going to discuss the importance of hypothalamic progesterone in female uh, reproduction and ovulation. I'm also going to talk about neuroprogesterone production. So this is progesterone synthesized within the brain itself by hypothalamic astrocytes. I'm also going to discuss uh, several different membrane-associated estrogen receptors and their rapid signaling pathway. Then I'm going to talk about that these several membrane-associated estrogen receptors will interact with metabotropic glutamate receptors. And finally, I'm going to discuss sex differences in hypothalamic astrocytes. The hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis is critical in female reproduction, which is uh, important for the estrous cycle in rats, which is analogous to the menstrual cycle in humans. In the hypothalamic pituitary axis, GnRH neurons will secrete GnRH into the hypophysial portal system, which stimulates pituitary gonadotropes to release FSH and LH, which then stimulate the oocytes in the ovary to grow and mature. And as the oocytes mature, 
they will secrete estradiol into the circulation. And then the estradiol feeds back on hypothalamus and pituitary, and there's normally a negative feedback, which will decrease the GnRH and then FSH and LH stimulation of the ovaries. So as the ovaries um, and the follicles mature, the estrogen levels will increase. And when it gets towards its peak, and, and the follicles are ready to ovulate, this negative estrogen feedback now becomes a positive estrogen feedback. It stimulates the GnRH neurons, which releases a surge of GnRH, which then stimulates the pituitary to release a surge of FSH and mainly LH to trigger ovulation. And so we see that there's a large surge and this triggers ovulation, and then in the rat it turns um, into the estrus phase. <clears throat> so not only do you need a very high level of estrogen in order to ovulate, you actually need progesterone also. And circulating estradiol induces the synthesis of progesterone receptors in the right hypothalamus. And in addition, a pre-ovulatory rise in progesterone, as well as progesterone receptor activation are both obligatory events for the GnRH and LH surges in rats. So in an experiment by Chapel and Levine in 2000, <coughs> they took female rats, they removed the ovaries, and then even though the ovaries are removed, if you give them a subcutaneous injection of estradiol, the brain will still have an LH surge that you can detect peripherally in the bloodstream. In another experiment, they take the same rats, and now before injecting estradiol, they gave a subcutaneous injection of progesterone receptor antagonists. So this blocks the progesterone receptor. And then they received the same injection of estradiol, but there's no longer an LH surge. So this tells us that progesterone receptors need to be activated in order for the LH surge to occur. And then in the third experiment, very similar, they took the same rats, and then in the third ventricle of the brain, they injected uh, progesterone receptor antisense oligodeoxynucleotides, which blocks translation of progesterone receptor. And again, after the estradiol, there's no LH surge. So this tells us that you need synthesis of a progesterone receptor. So you need synthesis and activation of progesterone receptors. So you really need progesterone now, in addition to the estrogen. So we wanted to be sure that this was um, a progesterone that's produced in the brain and not peripherally that goes and, and gets you know, taken up from the circulation. So there were studies back in, in, all the way back to 1974 where they measured peripheral levels of progesterone prior to the LH surge in rodents, and they did not see an increase in the per peripheral progesterone. Then in our laboratory in 2003, they took female rats, and they removed the ovary and the adrenal gland. And these are the two peripheral organs that can um, generate steroidogenesis and, and produce progesterone. So these were both removed, and if you give these rats injections of estradiol, you will also get an LH surge. And then prior to the LH surge, at about 52 hours uh, for the LH surge, but prior to that, we actually dissected different parts of the brain, the hypothalamus, the cerebellum, parietal cortex, and medulla. And we see that in females, that with, the, with the estradiol, which is in black, there's actually an increased amount of progesterone within the brain itself, even though the peripheral organs for progesterone are gone. And that's much higher than controls. And, and we do not see that in, in the males. So there's some sex difference, and the progesterone, we believe, is synthesized centrally. So what is the source of the hypothalamic progesterone? A study by Zoyan and Yan in 1999 isolated the main cell types of the central nervous system, neurons, which in this schematic here are one of the major cells of the brain. They're responsible for things such as memory, sensory function, motor function, um, and these were isolated. And then they also isolated oligodendrocytes, which are supportive cells, and the main function of oligodendrocytes is to make the myelin sheath around the axon of the neuron to promote action potential, reliability, and the speed of action potentials. And then you have astrocytes, which are thought initially to be supportive cells. They contribute a lot to the structure of the brain. They participate in the blood-brain barrier. Um, they can regulate the extracellular environment of the neurons. But in addition, they also can regulate um, a lot of neuronal function. They can regulate the synapses. They can respond to various peptides and hormones, and they can also secrete steroidal hormones, which I'll show you. So they isolated cultures of neurons, oligodendrocytes, and astrocytes. Then they, they exposed them to pregnenolone, which is the immediate precursor to progesterone. And then they measured the progesterone production. And we see that the astrocytes are the most productive in terms of progesterone. And well, I didn't show this, but they're actually the most productive in terms of steroid production in the brain. So therefore, our studies focused on astrocytes, specifically hypothalamic astrocytes, in order to produce their progesterone surge 
So now that we know we need estrogen and progesterone in order to have estrogen positive feedback, uh, but we need to know where is this estrogen acting? Are there estrogen receptors and astrocytes to actually carry out the um, signaling for estrogen? A study in, in 2004 by Victor Chavon basically took hypothalamic astrocytes, then lysed them, and then west, ran them on a western. So in B, you have the cytoplasmic and uh, nuclear fractions, and on the western blot, in lanes two, three, and four, uh, lane one is actually a control. So we see estrogen receptor alpha exists in lanes two, three, and four, which are our samples. Um, and then estrogen receptor beta also exists in lane three, uh, two, three, and four, which shows that there's estrogen receptor alpha and beta in the nuclear and cytoplasmic fraction. <coughs> then they isolated just the plasma membrane fraction. And then again, ran a western and probed it with estrogen receptor alpha, which we see here, and estrogen receptor beta. So this shows that, that, that there's actually estrogen receptor alpha and beta not only in the nucleus, but also in the plasma membrane. So this is somewhere where the estrogen can, can, can act. So there's evidence goes back, um, where suspicions for membrane estrogen receptors go back to the 1960s with electrophysiology studies. Uh, the main reason is that in those studies with estrogen, they give a, a large electrical response. In astrocytes, the main axis of response is an increase in free cytoplasmic calcium. When these cells are exposed to estradiol, they respond within order of seconds with a large release of intracellular calcium. So calcium is sequestered in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And then, with, with, so when estradiol signals, it actually releases the calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum and causes a, a free uh, spike in uh, calcium. Uh, John, uh, estradiol can dissociate very easily from uh, uh, algae. We and others have shown that many, many years ago. And I'm wondering, when you add that, uh, how much do you think, have you done some experiments where you've just added uh, the um, bound, uh, albumin bound uh, estradiol and then seen with assay, the free form and the bound form? Because that would be critical to say the action is pure in the membrane sure, or sure. someone is gone. Has sure. anyone done it? You may not have. Well, then, well so, so this study, I, 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 this study I did not work on. Um, no, but there, there was a paper, information. Right, right. No, there was, there was a paper in 1999 by Stevis, who basically, I think, took E6 BSA and E17 BSA, and it showed that there was, um, when you first dissolve it, there's actually a free form of estradiol, and then they used a micron cartridge, and they, and they used a filter, and the filtrate also had um, free estradiol. But then if they took the retentate, and then they re, I guess, re, we made the E6 BSA, that there was actually no free estradiol in that. And then, so I believe on these experiments, they actually did, did do that. They actually filtered it and then used the retentate. And I think they also used the filtrate, if I'm not mistaken, and there was no response to that filtrate. But there's also other, other evidence for membrane estrogen receptors that I'm gonna show you. So this is just the beginning. This is, I'm giving you some background before I... <coughs> um, so, so estradiol has a rapid um, free calcium response astrocytes, and if we use E6 BSA, which, which is basically estradiol that's conjugated to bovine serum albumin, which is a large molecule, it's membrane impermeable. So therefore, if you have a response, that usually means that it's reacting to something on the plasma membrane. And with E6 BSA, we actually also get a spike in calcium that is very similar in magnitude. So this suggests that the estradiol may act on a plasma membrane estrogen-associated. In addition, if you take hypothalamic cultures and you incubate them with estradiol, you actually get synthesis of progesterone. Again, this goes along with that the astrocyte can produce progesterone. Now, if you give the same cells thapsogargan, and thapsogargan is a calcium ATPase inhibitor, so normally calcium is sequestered into smooth endoplasmic reticulum. But if you give thapsogargan, it actually allows the release of this calcium, and the calcium spike is very similar uh, to the estradiol, and then in addition, after that to Gargan, if you stimulate with estradiol, you actually don't get any more response. So, so it tells us that the estradiol is acting on this movement of the plasma to, to release the calcium. And then that's a Gargan alone, without estrogen, <coughs> can actually increase the progesterone synthesis. So this kind of tells us that if you have a large release of calcium alone in these cells, this is enough. It's not specific to estradiol. So this brings us to the working model of estradiol regulation of the LH surge and estrogen positive feedback. So in this model, 
estrogen that increases with the maturing oocytes will act on an interneuron. This is, we believe, a kiss peptide neuron. And the estradiol will result in, in transcription and translation of progesterone receptors. We know this genomic response takes some time, so the estrogen uh, acts on this interneuron to produce the progesterone receptors. And then the estrogen also acts on hypothalamic astrocytes. And we believe it acts through a membrane estrogen receptor, which I'm gonna go over in this talk. So we're gonna try to clarify which receptor this is. In addition, there is some signaling that will signal through phospholipase C, produce IP3, which then has IP3 receptors on a smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and that releases the calcium. And then the calcium that's released will activate various kinases, <coughs> such as protein kinase C and protein kinase A, which results in phosphorylation of enzymes. And then the enzyme activity, we believe, increases, uh, such as P450 SEC, STAR, and possibly pregnenolone. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, 3 beta HSD, which will increase pregnenolone and progesterone synthesis. And then the, uh, at the high levels of estrogen and progesterone, it'll stimulate the interneuron together to release and, and uh, stimulate generation neurons, and that releases a surge of GnRH to stimulate gonad uh, gonadotropes in the pituitary to release a surge of LH to, tr to trigger ovulation. Now from um, hippocampal and, and um, hypothalamic neurons, they've demonstrated that the estrogen receptor can actually signal through a glutamate receptor. So therefore, in my studies, I wanted to see if this is also true in hypothalamic astrocytes. So from here on out is all, all my data. So I just wanted to let you know. And it, so in my system, we have a, a gravity perfusion system where we perfuse um, astrocyte cultures in uh, media and then give them boluses of, of estrogen or other drugs. And when you give them estrogen within 10 seconds, you'll see an increase in free cytoplasmic calcium. So the first thing we did is do a dose response curve for um, calcium increase. So we see that at 0.1 nanomolars of estradiol, we actually get a significant increase in calcium. And then by <coughs> one nanomolar, it's actually a maximal increase because at 10 and 100 nanomolars, the, the, the response doesn't increase any further. And so this is actually physiologically relevant. The peak levels of estradiol in the rodent uh, prior to the LN surge in estrogen positive feedback is in the hundreds of picomolars, so it's somewhere in between these two. So these are our relevant ranges where the calcium is going to go up. When you present data like this and you have your sample size, is this, um, are you uh, um, imaging a single astrocyte and, uh, or is it, so is that? These are, the yeah, 25, yeah, so 25 individual, 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 individual astrocytes. And how many, how many cultures uh, were created to produce that 25? Um, it typically takes about, I mean, I, 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 it, it ranges, but at best it takes about two or three runs, so two or three separate cultures. Um, but sometimes if, if they don't respond well or if, if the plating is very sparse, then it, it, could take, it could take, like up to 25, it could take many runs. So in order to demonstrate that this estradiol is acting through estrogen receptors, we actually did the same experiment and we blocked the estrogen receptor with ICI 182.780. So again, with the astrocytes normally would respond with a calcium increase, but if you block the estrogen receptor, the response is attenuated. So this demonstrates that it acts on the estrogen receptor. So then we wanted to see what the dose response was for progesterone production. Uh, we actually did more concentrations at either end, but I just wanted to show the main points. So at 0.5 nanomolars, there's no significant progesterone production. At 0.75 nanomolars, there's an increase, but it's not statistically significant. Then by one nanomolar, there's actually maximal progesterone production. And then if you, we did 10, 100, and 1,000 nanomolars, and pretty much the progesterone response was, was the same. So this tells us that there's a very narrow window of estradiol that will stimulate progesterone synthesis. So even though the calcium starts a little bit earlier to go up, there may be a threshold value, and, and there's a very small window, so this is also consistent with, with a possible positive feedback mechanism, where the estrogen increases, and there's no progesterone for an LA surge, and then when it gets close to the peak, um, around one nanomolar, then you also have a lot of progesterone, and it's gonna allow for positive estrogen feedback. Also of significance, uh, these were incubated for 60 minutes, but we wanted to see if this was a genomic, uh, a genomic versus a non-genomic response. So we, if we, we, we figured if it's a fast response, it's most likely sleeping through a membrane estrogen receptor and not a genomic response with 
Therefore, we take the same cultures and we treat it only for five minutes with one animal of estradiol, and again, we see that there's pretty much already a maximal response, and the controls here are very, very um, slow in producing progesterone. But some people were complaining that, that it may be a little long, so we, we just did five minutes. But that's the another way definitely of doing it is the plot transcription. But, but we didn't do it, we just did a five minute really rapid. Um, and then we wanted to demonstrate if the signaling mechanism is similar to neurons and that the estrogen receptor will signal through a glutamate receptor, specifically um, mGluR1A, so type 1A. And LY367385 is antagonist for the MGLR1A. So again, if we do this experiment and then we perfuse with the um, blocker first and then give a dose of estradiol, we see that the res calcium response is attenuated. So this tells us that the signaling mechanism involves MGLR1A. Then we wanted to also demonstrate this with our uh, progesterone assay. And again, controls and the antagonist didn't increase progesterone. The estradiol gave a maximal response but then we pre-incubated with LY for half an hour and then gave both together and that blocked the response, the progesterone response. Again, signaling to that, that the mgr one a is involved. So, so now that we know that mgr one a is involved, we wanted to see what would happen if we just stimulated the glutamate receptor without estradiol. So we tried to do a dose response curve um, at one in 10 nanomolars and there, there was no significant calcium increase. By 100 nanomolars, there was a significant increase, but it wasn't very high. Then the literature reported that HPG, which is mgr one a agonist, at 50 micromolars gives a maximal response in hypothalamic astrocytes for calcium MG. So therefore, when we did that, we got a, we got a pretty high response, and actually it was quite, quite uh, interesting that it was actually the same response that we would get with one animal of estradiol. So these two are very similar. And then we thought, what would happen if we activated both receptors together? So we used both with a maximum dose, and we got a, even a higher response. And then we, we thought, well, you know, does the